Um, we always like to say that there's room for improvement and we wish that there was something a little different with this amendment, but we understand that that's a part of negotiation. And so I will encourage our members to support this amendment. Any further discussion on the A55 amendment? Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Would uh, Senator Pratt yield for a question? Senator Pratt will yield. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, looking at the amendment, it is a, a $25 million appropriation, uh, but can we clarify, is the, the language already in the existing bill that uh, gives these uh, people at the nonprofits access to file for claims? Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So, uh, Senator Rarick, yes, in Section 5, Item B, the, uh, uh, the nonprofits, the hospitals, the school districts uh, would be waived of their requirement to reimburse the, the, the Unemployment Trust Fund. Um, and as it stands in the bill, that entire amount would fall on to the premium paying employers and their employees. Uh, this says that $25 million would go to offset that cost to the, to the premium paying employers. Senator Eric. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Senator Pratt, for that. Um, you know, that is, I know, a, a concern for many out there uh, in regards to unemployment insurance that uh, um, I know I've worked closely with a number of folks in the schools, uh, bus drivers, kitchen workers who are trying to get qualified for this and they have known all along that because they hadn't, uh, school districts were not putting money into the UI, that was something that was negotiated long ago, that is why they were not eligible. Um, and so I guess th this is a very important uh, piece to be added into this legislation that uh, we're, we're going to be paying for these benefits uh, for folks instead of putting that burden on businesses that have been putting that in, so thank you. Any further discussion on the A55 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is adopted. Any further discussion on Senate File 31? Senator Buck. Senator Buck. Well, thank you, Mr. President. M members, uh, we're all troubled, I think, by this pandemic. And <clears throat> last spring, I got up on the floor here before we adjourned and said, you know, there'll be plenty of time, uh, support Governor Walls and his emergency orders because there'll be plenty of time in hindsight to look back and see what was done right, uh, plenty of time to be critical. And I'm sure that even he and members of the administration are looking back now at some of the decisions that were made and thinking, boy, I wish I had done that a little bit differently for how people are being impacted. And I, like many of you, have reached out to the administration and said, well, you know, this doesn't make sense. And, and, I, and I think about last spring when the ice was going out, the dock installers were prohibited from going out and putting people's docks in, pro prohibited from putting their shore stations in. And the houseboat operators couldn't operate up in my district. I've got a lot of houseboat operators in Voyagers National Park and on Lake Vermilion, but a family could go stay at a cabin, but the same family couldn't go rent a houseboat. And there were a lot of unintended, I, I think, unintended things that happened uh, uh, because there was no legislative oversight where the legislature gets a chance to vet issues before uh, they're enacted. And now we've got a, another shutdown, unfortunately. And again, we've got unintended, I think, unintended people on the part of the governor that are being impacted. Uh, I got a call last night from a, a, an individual in my district who owns an indoor shooting range. Ten, ten different shooting ranges or, or you know, stations to shoot at. Piece of plate steel between every one of those things. Uh, and last week, a letter was delivered them from the Attorney General, and he said they had to close down. 
Well, it's a training facility, and they're licensed to train the U.S. Border Patrol, the National Guard, all kinds of local law enforcement agencies around the state, and there's some recreational shooting that happens there. But it certainly can be done safely with masks and other protocols that are required. And, and another one, last week I got a couple calls from people that sponsor uh, snowmobile radar runs out on the ice. And, you know, they plow a, a, a trail for sleds to, to sleds to go on, and they have different classes, and people shoot a radar gun to see how fast they can go, and people get trophies. And it's a, it's a sport that a lot of people enjoy in the wintertime. Most of it takes place up in my district. And DNR won't give them a permit to hold an outdoor radar run out on a lake uh, where all the participants are wearing helmets and the spectators are all outside. And so I've been trying to work with DNR. Isn't there some protocols, some contingencies you can put on this license so they can have these events? And I'm sure all of us have found situations where constituents have called us like that. And because uh, some things just don't make sense and some things are unintended. And that, members, is the problem with, with legislating like we are where the governor issues executive orders, unintend I think mostly unintended things happen. Uh, I'm sure the governor didn't intend for Hudson, Wisconsin, or Superior, Wisconsin, or Fargo, North Dakota to have a windfall of business after a shutdown, but you all have read it in the newspapers what's happening in some of our border communities uh, across the river. Uh, they're benefiting uh, a lot. And this bill, Members, $217 million, a little north of that. You know, I, you know, back when I chaired the tax committee, I used to tell people, you know, we don't print the money in the basement. We actually have to take it from somebody. So, you know, we're all going to take the vote, and, you know, maybe almost everybody is going to vote for this, and we're going to get nice emails from businesses saying thanks for helping out but it's the taxpayers that are putting the money up to try and make a small effort at least to keep a bunch of our businesses whole here. And Senator Pratt, the real, the real I think, problem, and, and you saw it on the Pappas Amendment when both leaders got up and said, we have agreed, the four leaders, that there'll be no amendments. Uh, you know, and I was in that role once and was in a, situ in, in a situation much like that, so the rest of us have nothing to say about what's in the bill. There's maybe a dozen people that got together over the last few weeks and crafted a bill that spent $217 million, and we don't have a copy of it, I don't at least, to, to really know what, what's in it. So Senator Proud, I understand the difficult circumstances, executive orders get in place, things happen, and then everyone points to the legislature this bad stuff is happening to me because of the ex executive order. Legislature, please bail us out. And so it's where we, we find ourselves today, trying to mitigate some of the damages that are being done. So let me just plea with the governor as he considers what he's going to do on Wednesday. Governor, I have six grandchildren between K through five. None of them are in school today. None of them are going to be in school next week. They're not going to be in school the rest of the year. I don't know when they're going to go back to school. But I do know that the University of Minnesota has done a lot of research on the amount of brain development that happens in those very early years of life. And our young learners are being hurt greatly by what is going on. We have to figure out, Governor, how to get those young kids back in school. And members, in three weeks, we're going to be back here, uh, all of us, all 201 of us. We're all going to have a little more to say once we get into our regular session. But S Senator Gazelka, Senator Kent, my request would be, let's not bring another bill to the floor like this. If the governor decides he wants to extend his emergency orders, 
he shouldn't just assume we're going to pass another $200 million of cash, frankly, members that we probably don't have uh, sitting around here uh, when, when we start putting this next budget together. So the next package, I would argue to all four leaders, introduce a bill, send it through the normal committee process, and we won't have situations like the Pappas Amendment where we didn't get to hear anything from the Craft Brewers Guild, we didn't get to hear anything from the Teamsters, we didn't get to hear anything from any of the people that potentially are impacted by a significant amendment on the floor of the Senate that should be vetted in the committee process. So as we move forward and get into session, I look forward to all of us uh, coming back, and I, I hope many of us can find a way to be safe and, and I'm over 65, so I'll probably get the vaccine sooner than some of you uh, will. Uh, but let's go through the process of introducing bills in the House and the Senate, take them through the committees, uh, so that we all know what's in, we all have an opportunity to participate in this process. I think we all want to help those businesses out there that are impacted, but it would be, I, I think there'll be less unintended consequences if bills get vetted through the normal committee process. That's why, members, we suspended the state constitution today so that we could do this. The reason that the constitution, that provisions in the constitution that says bills have to get hearings on three different days on, this, on the Senate floor is so that we can mitigate the number of unintended things that happen. And there'll be unintended things in this bill, there'll be unintended things in the next executive order, but fewer of them is better. So, so Governor, as you consider what uh, you're going to do, I just would request on the, the businesses in my district and on behalf of my grandchildren in the elementary grades, let's figure out how we can get back to a more normal state. A lot of people are being hurt. A lot of people uh, are being hurt that maybe wouldn't have to be hurt. And I would say to the public, we are, we are not going to get to a more normal situation until we all, until we all start paying attention to the recommendations of the CDC and the Department of Health, wear a mask, stay six feet away from people, don't stay too long visiting with anybody, stay out of large groups. We've got to get our arms around this pandemic. We cannot wait for six or eight months for the vaccine to get to a level of herd immunity. We have to get this fixed before that. We cannot lose the entire school year for our kids. Senator Swedinsky, I think, would agree with that. Kids need to be, especially young kids, need to be in school. And all of us in the public can help accomplish that if we just follow those protocols that we know are proven to reduce the spread of the virus. So, Mr. Mr. President, that's, uh, thanks for indulging me and getting me a, an opportunity to speak on this. I look forward to being back here in three weeks and, and engaging in the real legislative process where real bills get put together through the, the difficult process that uh, the House and Senate have to go through to get something enacted into law. And I look forward to a time when we get the next bill up on this floor and we don't have to suspend the Constitution to do it. Secretary will give the bill Senate File 31 its third reading. Senate, Senate File Number 31, a bill for an act relating to state government. Third reading. Any further discussion? Senator Herr. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I rise to support the, uh, this bill, uh, the COVID-19 relief package. I also rise uh, to get confident to our, Minnesotans, our Minnesota families, workers, and small business that may have cultural and language barrier that help is here for them. Although it's not the ultimate, but little help is better than nothing. And it's a continuing process that will continue to figure a solution. I also want to encourage those who may be put at the back of the line and may miss opportunity of getting support uh, during the first time around. 
Although 216 million is a lot, but when you divide to the number of businesses and families and workers, you know, the amount uh, becomes smaller and smaller. And this bill will give a little relief, bridging our small businesses, support for our small businesses until the federal uh, dollars is here. And I have hope that the federal dollar has been here already, but it is what it is. I also want to express my appreciation for Senator Pratt and the working group, Senator Bobby Joe Champion, for working on extending the unemployment benefit uh, for nearly 13 weeks. This will bring some relief to 125 workers that may lose uh, their unemployment check right around Christmas time. And most of this money will go to pay their rent, mortgage, foods, and other essential that will go back right away to our economy. One thing that I'm disappointed on is the unable of putting the $500 direct check to low-income neighbors. And one is aspect of a struggle low-income families facing during this time is that both parent, parent having to leave home to work, but at the same time, have one of them have to supervise their children distant learning. And to a large degree, this will impact our children's learning and will leave our children behind even further. On a different point, uh, Mr. President, uh, will Senator Pratt yield? Senator Pratt will yield. Senator. Uh, Senator Pratt, I'm happy to see the $14 million carve out for movie theaters and convention hall. I just want to know if uh, stage theater that employs many people and all the essential cultural entertainment and arts expression uh, in our communities and our state. Um, I received a call from one of my constituents uh, from the Eastside St. Paul, uh, who is a stage owner and uh, is at the brink of financial ruin uh, during this time. So can you tell me uh, why is the stage theater left, left out from this category and how will um, individual like him able to assess these dollars? Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and Senator Herr. Uh, this, that theater would qualify if it has movie screens, it would qualify under the deed program based on the number of screens that they have. If they don't qualify as a movie theater under the deed program, that is the reason we have the county bucket. And that theater could then go apply for a grant through the county in order to be, uh, to, to help to survive. I've often said that this isn't to make any business whole through this loss. It's just simply to keep the plywood out of the windows while their doors are locked. Senator Herr. Thank you, Senator Pratt, for the information. And like I say earlier, uh, one reason that I rise is to give confidence for our Minnesota families, workers, small business that may have language barrier or cultural barrier or may be at the back of the line so that they are informed. Um, of the bill that we passed, and thank you. Senator Rarick. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, you know, members, I think, you know, I'm not going to repeat a lot of what uh, Senator Bach said, um, but I am in pretty full agreement with a lot of his statements that, uh, you know, the process that we've been going through has been fairly tough as a, a member and not having the input you would like to have and, you know, 
especially with the emergency orders and feeling like we're shut out and a number of things like that. And then when negotiations happen and a few members get to do that. And I think we miss out on a lot of things by not having that committee process. Um, ideas that those of us from all different areas would bring uh, to the discussion and help us work through. And you know, this is uh, gonna be a, a good bill. Is it a, a great bill? Probably not, but it is going to help our businesses hopefully survive. Um, but there are a few things I would like to, you know, to mention and have people understand and have the public understand. And uh, you know, the piece about helping our businesses we are probably all going to hear from a number of our companies who are figuring they're going to qualify for some of this money in the fastest bucket. And unfortunately, they will not because of that 30% decline in sales for quarter two and quarter three. Um, you know, our bars and restaurants, a lot of uh, people when they were allowed to reopen, supported them by doing the takeouts. Their profits, didn't come back. They were making very little because we've heard, you know, they weren't getting to sell drinks, which is where they get their profits. So they were selling food, which because their suppliers had raised costs, they had to raise their prices. So as far as sales are concerned, they probably didn't see a 30% drop in sales. But I get it, we can't, it's tough to dig into that and, and make a bill perfect and see all that. But be aware, um, we're gonna be hearing from people who thought they were gonna get help that are not. Um, thus, the, the county piece, and, and I think that's important. And we as senators have to be ready to reach out to our counties and help them understand what we are intending with this. That. This isn't necessarily something that if they get 200 companies or businesses that apply for a grant, that they divide their amount by 200 and give each of them the exact same amount. That we are asking them to look at who was most impacted by these shutdowns. Maybe a local restaurant received the money from Department of Revenue but that's not nearly enough for how they were impacted and the county can give them more. And so we, we need to work, our job isn't done here today. Our job is gonna continue along with our talking to our counties to say, you know, please look at that. We are giving you flexibility, take advantage of that. You know who's been impacted more than others and, and give them more. You know, another thing, these shutdowns and, and COVID, they have been disastrous to some industries. And yet we also know other industries have thrived through this and have seen record sales and record profits. And so there are things that you know, we need to look at and, and I struggle, you know, I know we have people out there who need the extension of the 13 weeks for unemployment. Their businesses have been shut down. There is no job for them to go to. I know my experience in construction. Commercial construction has died off. Companies are not investing. They're not building. They're not remodeling. We, ha we see record high unemployment uh, for this time of year. That uh, the folks in the hospitality industries that have been shut down, they don't have jobs to go to. But we also have seen industries like manufacturing that they are booming right now, but they can't man the work. A staffing agency reached out to me. They are being contacted by companies that have never used staffing agencies to try to man work in the past because their employees will not come back. A job that they had that was going to pay over $15 an hour, they called 200 people who are currently unemployed who refused to take that call. If we're going to get this economy really up and going again, 
We have to get people back to work in the industries that need workers. So I, I, that was a piece I really struggled with seeing that we didn't put some kind of restrictions in, you know, back years ago, you used to have to go in personally to collect your unemployment check and prove that you had applied at at least three places for work and they had turned you down. I don't know if we necessarily want to or need to go back to that, but we should be looking at play, people whose industries are back working again and getting them back to work. And I think we missed a few things too. You know, I had a shared work piece that I know was in the negotiations and, and was left out. You know, I think that would have been a perfect provision for some of these companies. Or say an eight-person company that's had a slowdown, they know that slowdown's temporary because of COVID. And instead of laying off two people and potentially never getting them back to their company, though they don't want to lose them, but they have to, they could have all eight people take a slowdown work fewer hours, all eight people would receive limited benefits from unemployment, but that way that company can keep all eight people employed, and when everything comes back, they still have their trained employees, their people that they know can do their work. So, you know, that's something I'm going to be bringing back in regular session and talking about. Um, but I think with COVID especially, that was a piece that I really wish could have been in here. You know, ultimately, we need to be back in session. I'm lo really looking forward to that so we can get back to our committee process, get back to members really being able to have input and be involved. And we really need to get people back to work and get our economy open. Back in March, we didn't know what was happening. We didn't know a lot. We know a lot more now. Companies are doing what they can to be safe. People know a lot more about what they should do or shouldn't do. We really, really need to get things back open and get our economy back to where it is. Then we don't have to talk about having some taxpayers give $200 million to others to, so that they can survive. Let's, let's let people get back to work. That's what they want. A lot of people in my district are calling me. Um, they want to be back to work. Um, they want to provide for themselves. So I, I hope we can work towards that end. And again, just like a get our schools open like Senator Box said. That is, should be our number one. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Champion. Senator Champion. Maybe Senator Champion. Are you ready, Senator Champion? Senator Champion's not ready. Senator Abler. Now are you back? <laughs> Senator, Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. President. I am back. I want to say We're that, happy to have you, too. <laughs> thank you, Mr. President. I will say that um, the bill that is before us has taken a lot of work. There's a number of different people who worked very hard in order for us to get to this particular point in place. I would be remiss if I didn't say that we wish that it could always be better. I have a model that says there's always room for improvement. And here is no exception. We wish that we had more money in order to give our small businesses as well as our workers. Because equally, uh, they're important to the great state of Minnesota. I'm also pleased to know that, you know, there's a specific calling out even in this bill for nonprofit arts organizations and and others because we think that that community is very important and we want to do everything we can and we want to um, encourage the counties to really make sure that they support our nonprofit arts organizations. So I also want to thank um, uh, uh, Senator Kent and all the others who uh, have worked really hard on our side of the aisle in order to make sure that we are thinking about and lifting up and fighting for um, all Minnesotans, and thank you to Senator Pratt and all the others who also participated, um, the, the, the administration, and I, I specifically also want to call out Commissioner Grove and Commissioner Doty um, from, from DEED as well as from the Department of Revenue. And I just want to say that we know that we wish we could do more, 
but what you have before you is us stepping in to do the very best we can in order to make sure that we can look out for employers as well as employees. So thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to Senator Pratt and all the others on the Jobs Committee. Uh, and uh, thank you for all those who believe in us because we, wanna, we want them to know that we do believe in them because we are one Minnesota. Senator Abler. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, this discussion actually began last March, if uh, anybody remembers, and we were uh, faced with this novel circumstance and the executive order started to happen. And, and uh, Minnesota, I think, uh, has tried really hard to, uh, to do the right thing. Um, but if anybody is not paying attention, the frustration level is getting mammoth. I, uh, go around town to various stores to work on things, and people come up to me more than ever they ever have. Uh, usually I'm invisible, suburban people, like they're, you know, they get so mad they almost call. But uh, they're not there now. They're writing, they're calling, and they say, can't you do something? Can you do something? And it's been really frustrating to, to talk about, uh, about that because the way this is set up, there's not a lot we can do. We get to pass out some money today, which I'll mention. Um, but one man told me yesterday, he said, it is so unfair that the governor is asking me to take one for the team when he has his housing and his health care and, uh, and his staff all has all of that intact. And this man was worried about losing all of those things. And it reminded me of the blessings I've enjoyed, but it also made me wanted to burst coming in here the last several days knowing I'd be standing here saying something hopefully interesting and hopefully not redundant, but trying to make a little bit uh, of a difference. Um, I, I've said all along that the first job should be worry about nursing homes. Two days ago, uh, an article in the Tribune, desperate at Death Ridge, one place was so bad. We have failed to protect our seniors in nursing homes. Do you know, Mr. President, we're number five from the bottom? Of the five-state area, North Dakota is a little worse than they have a, but it's, we're 46th in the country in terms of how well we've done. And, and so that's horrible. I just, the deaths, still two-thirds of the deaths are coming from nursing homes and places where people are trusted to look after them, overseen directly by my very well-intended governor who this bothers him a lot, but we have failed. The battle plan is a failure. And it's, these kind of articles should never have to be written. Kudos to Mr. Sears for his research and, and bringing that to, to light. Um, high school sports uh, canceled the week before the playoffs. My kids played sports. It's been the most horrible year for these seniors. And somebody mentioned education and it's, I don't know how they ever get it back. Really, we had it canceled a week ahead. And while we decide to crack down on uh, restaurants and, and bars, and um, it, it just doesn't make sense. And so these restaurant owners are very frustrated. If you didn't read about uh, Grand Forks, the one person foolishly decided to open, and the whole force and weight of the state is coming down. In the paper, there's a discussion that maybe 200 places are opening on Wednesday. And the Commissioner of Public Safety says that people should not be allowed to flout the law. We now have people who are worried about paying their mortgage and buying their health care and maybe buying their kids something for Christmas, who are now forced to become renegades and, and lawbreakers as they try to find a way to do the right thing. They have already, in most of these cases, have great, gone to great efforts to purify their air, to distance their tables, to have their staffs wash their hands and practice extreme levels of sanitation better than some of those nursing homes, Mr. President. And they were told just de facto to close after they thought they could get to stay open after they limited themselves to, to 10 o'clock. And Mr. President, I don't know the last time that a bunch of sports parents decided they had to sue the governor. What? So my sons enjoyed sports immensely. It, it contributed a lot to their experience. But we never felt like we were in a position where they were going to be denied the right to play their last game. And uh, we were supposed to leave that to the schools. 
Senator Hoffman and I worked with the governor's office and the staff uh, of different departments to clarify that the school districts had that authority and they were doing a good job of it. And the parents and the teachers and the sports uh, players and the coaches had all worked it out. And the governor said like, like no. So today we're spending $241 million and money well spent because we have to but it is the biggest single waste of money we have made in our time because it all was unnecessary. It's going to patch the hole on an unnecessary shutdown that should never have happened. And it should have happened if it was going to be in concert with the local circumstances. And so the $241 million, Mr. President, isn't falling from the sky as Senator Bach. It's, it's actually our, our deficit is great. The reason we have a surplus in this biennium, the last year of it, is that the federal government gave us much more money in human services, more than a billion. It wasn't due to genius management that we have a $641 million surplus. If you take away the federal bonus money, we have a deficit even now. And I will tell you, and I will warn you, uh, that the $241 million is not going to come out of education. It's not going to come out of roads. It's not going to come out of us. It's going to come out of the human services side. And some of these very people that we have sworn to defend in nursing homes and the people with disabilities are going to be the ones to take the brunt of that. And we're going to leave some people at the door, at the curb, to handle what we're paying now that did not have to be spent. And yeah. so my people say, isn't there something you can do? And I want to, I, I talked to the governor about this in September and November. And so we had this conversation, suddenly I feel like I'm talking out of turn, but Governor, you're losing the rank and file Minnesotans. You have soccer moms suing you, you have, you have God-fearing, law-abiding, highly ethical businesses flouting the law, risking being their businesses shut down. And that is not what you ran on. It doesn't build trust, it doesn't build one Minnesota. I went to you when you first got elected, said I want to work with you, I want to help you. How can we make this go? And Governor and Mr. President and whoever else is listening, could you let these businesses be sincere in their efforts? Could you let the good people who have already done all the accommodations any department could ask them to function? These responsible owners, their responsible staff. I was invited by the Attorney General to be on a council studying economic uh, status of women because I voted for it way back when and I'm thinking about it. Some of the people, most, the bulk of the people that are being affected by this unnecessary shutdowns of the bars and restaurants and health clubs are those women. They're, they're single mothers, they're women with modest incomes, uh, and just that are just trying to make a go of it. I met one yesterday. And so, <laughs> I just I wish I could sleep at night. I'm not worrying about that. So, Mr. President, I've, I've gone on long enough, but Minnesotans care, I care, and let the people who can do it well, let them do it. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Pratt, for bringing this bill forward. I, too, am going to vote in favor of it, but have some serious con concerns. I just got a text from a constituent this week. His name is Mike Swanson. He owns Fitness in Motion in Variable, a health club. His quote to me was, I've been watching what's going on in the legislature. I understand there's a, a, a bill coming that will give us some relief. He said, I don't care if you vote for it. He said, we don't want a handout. We want to open our businesses. Uh, this is happening across Minnesota. Uh, my background in the restaurant business, you know, 15,000, 20,000, or 25,000, as, as the, the package will do, is great. But it's nothing in comparison to what our businesses are losing in revenue and income. It's merely a life support for so many businesses that need more support than this. This may get them by a little bit longer, but they're afraid by the, passing this package it gives the governor an excuse to continue to keep them closed, and they don't want that. They want to be open. They said it's a drop in the butt, a bucket for what we need, but obviously they're open to getting something. Also, as far as the restaurants go, they have to plan to open. They have to get inventory in stock so they don't lose it again, which they've done last time. Now they don't know what to do. 
A friend of mine who owns a bar in Fairwell, Dawn Walker, doesn't know to order inventory or not. And if they can open on Friday, will she have inventory to sell? These are difficult things in the bar and restaurant hospitality industry. Also, I want to go talk to a, a gal who called me just today, Carrie Tuma from Faribault. And I'm not sure if she was screaming or crying on the phone, but she wants our kids back in school. Senator Box had a great comment today about getting our kids back in school. We need to do that. It's the number one thing I hear in my community is get our kids back in school. So I'm going to vote in favor of this bill today. But senators, this does not do what we need to do to continue to help our small businesses and businesses across Minnesota, get them reopened so they can get their life back as what it used to be. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Weger. Thank you, Mr. President, members. This has been the most disruptive chapter in Minnesota history, particularly in our public schools. I rise to speak in favor of one of the provisions in Article 6, addressing free and reduced lunch. Over 300,000 students, over one-third, are now receiving free and reduced lunch and breakfast. And the reason is, if they did not have that meal, their learning would be greatly impacted. I want to just reflect back on Senator Alice Johnson, who led the charge for breakfast in our schools. And as she often reminded us, that you're not going to learn on an empty stomach. And this bill points out that we need additional time to get that free and reduced count up, because there are students going without meals. And the disruption through the pandemic has caused uh, a lack of a full report, and this will give us a few more weeks, as Chair Nelson pointed out. And I'm pleased that we could reach a bipartisan agreement on that provision. Food shelves and others are needed, though, to address the pandemic in terms of the impact, in part, on food insecurity. And this provision will help not only that, in Article 6, but it will help in the aid that's provided in compensatory revenue and in Title I. Uh, the School Boards Association and other groups have asked for it, and I want to thank them for doing it. And I also want to remind members that there are so many needs in our schools, public and private, right now. I'm talking about just food, economic security, but mental health needs are staggering. And this was pre-COVID. Uh, most of us just received a letter from NAMI, uh, Sue Aberholden and others, talking about the increased risks in families, suicide, at-risk behaviors that are going on. And so there is a significant amount of work that needs to be done. All of us, in a bipartisan way, care about these students. We want them back in school, but we want them to be safe. We want the staff to be safe. So major challenges as we plan ahead. But I remain optimistic that we can work cooperatively. We at least have put this package together. Let it be an omen that we can do more in the future because there's nothing more important than remembering students are our future. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Bingham. Thank you, Mr. President. A um, lot, uh, lot of good speeches this evening, and um, I am glad to hear so many people getting on the train about having committees. It's one that I have been driving, Mr. President, since June. I think the committee process um, has been abhorrent during these special sessions, and there's been some informational hearings, very few, um, and you can't have amendments offered, so we end up doing what happened today. And I want to, to thank everybody that put this bill together, but I also want to echo people's 
concerns that this isn't this isn't going to go far enough, and I think we need to manage some expectations. So I do want to thank everybody. I do intend on supporting the bill. Um, earlier tonight, the, there was a resolution to rescind the governor's executive orders, and those executive orders covered things such as um, testing, protections for workers from unsafe working conditions, protections for Minnesotans from price gouging, um, sus suspension of uh, evictions for homeowners and renters, um, you know, being able to have additional protections for the Minnesota uh, veterans' homes. All of these things are covered by the governor's executive orders, and not one of those things has had a hearing that could have been used to draw down or wind down those executive orders, Mr. President. So. We can do something. The leadership, meaning the majority party in this body, can do something, and that's have hearings. We started today at 3. We could have come in, we could have recessed, we could have had a committee hearing in Chair Nelson's committee about the food um, free and reduced lunch. We could have had a hearing um, in uh, Commerce about the breweries. The breweries need help. The breweries need help. And we need to have a discussion about how that, that is able to be done. And they have financial help here in this bill, but there's bipartisan work going on about the breweries. Yep, that doesn't get hearings. It doesn't matter whether we're in um, session or in special, regular session or, or, or special session, it doesn't get hearings. There's nothing in here about helping our daycare providers and people to pay for daycare or long-term care, nothing. Bills introduced, no hearings. Good stuff, Mr. President, no hearings. We deserve to have an open and transparent process, and this has been far from it. Related to the bill um, before us, uh, I, I believe that, again, going back to managing expectations, and Senator Rarikid on a couple of this, a couple of these items, um, you know, the limited scope and, and the limited resources, if you will, um, in the bill <clears throat> are what is going to kind of limit us to be able to help folks, but this is needed. Um, I spoke to a lot of restaurant owners and bar owners in my district, and what wasn't included in this or the consideration was the increase in food prices, and they had to increase their prices, which gave them you know, more gross um, receipts, and that's what this is based off of also doesn't take into consideration the money and the resources they put in to have outdoors patios and spaces during the third quarter. Um, it's, it really um, deserved a fair and transparent hearing in um, Chair Pratt's committee where we could have had the hospitality industry come in, we could have had um, restaurant owners and bar owners come in. And now I'm um, always talking about my favorite subject, which, Mr. President, you know our counties and their role. You know, they're an important factor of this three-tiered, uh, not tiered, three different um, pots of money, all to be used at the same time. So um, they have until March. That's great. They probably wanted that. And it's going to take almost every bit of that. Maybe they'll get done by the beginning of February between their meetings and there's some counties, Mr. President, that hire um, con consultants that will help administer this money and that takes time. And that takes, um, you know, a process of putting together to, to vet and solicit um, for the money that the counties will be distributing. So it's not of their fault, but I know that I've had multiple meetings with my chambers and all the business owners on there said, time is of the essence. Well, that county pot money, time isn't going to be of this essence because that's going to take a little bit. So this is a necessary bill. It's going to help some businesses. But don't be surprised, as Senator Rarick said, if you have businesses calling you and if you have some county commissioners calling you on it. Um, also, I think it's important, and maybe it can be highlighted by Chair Pratt, talk a little bit more about the nonprofits, because I've had a lot of calls about that, and I don't recall that being talked about in presentation of the bill. So I'm not asking him to yield, Mr. President, but I do think it's an important factor. 
Um, so I'm going to be voting for this bill. And again, I thank everybody that put the time and the effort into uh, writing the bill. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm glad to be here today uh, to talk about some things, and then there's other things that are very heavy on my heart. But first, let's look at the good things today. Number one, we've got vaccines that are here that are going to help prevent the spread of this pandemic that, we, that has turned our lives upside down and that we have been talking about for hours here and hours before, and there will be more to do. That's a good thing, and we should rejoice in that. I'm thankful for those brilliant scientists, those epidemiologists, those researchers, those doctors who came together, the world came together, really, and worked on this vaccine. And I'm glad for the bill before us today. I thank Senator Pratt for his leadership here, and I think about the small businesses, and this is where it gets a little sad. And I'm sure all of you in your districts, too, have seen business after business close permanently. That is very difficult. And it's hard to think about those families who have run these small businesses. I'll tell you, hospitality is very important in my district. Hospitality has been hit, has been hit very hard. And we've seen restaurant after restaurant after restaurant close. And they're not opening again. They've already said we just can't, it's not sustainable. The losses have been too great. And I'm glad for the bill that we have going out of this chamber tonight that will help bring some relief. I think it's a bridge, quite frankly. It's a bridge to what we think the federal government will do. They do have the levers for the significant amount of relief that is needed. But I'm glad that the Minnesota Senate is passing this bridge relief right now. And it will be backfilled by federal funds should they come in. So that, that, that is a good thing. So I am, I'm pleased about the relief for our small businesses. And I think about the boutiques, the, the, the little shops in my district that I frequent all too often probably, and yet they are struggling. They are struggling. So this, this bill is going to be a good bill for them, and I'm glad to co-sponsor this along with Senator Pratt. But then I think about our kids. And I can't help but get very sad about what's happening to our children. I have a friend who has a kindergarten boy. This young child missed out on preschool last year and this year. His kindergarten is distance learning. Imagine what that is doing to a young kid. That is so, so difficult to have, to learn to read when you're not with a teacher. And we are, we're going to pay for this for years, members. Our children are suffering. They're going to continue to suffer. The achievement gaps have grown exponentially. The number of kids failing has grown by multiples, tens of multiples. We have got to do a better job about with educating our kids in this pandemic. And we can. There are innovative things that we can do. And I call on the governor to be open to those things. And with that, I would say that I hope that our teachers are prioritized when it comes to vaccines. We need to get them in the, class, in the classroom safely. And then I want to speak again to the second part of the bill, which is the unemployment. And this is where it's really hard to see young Minnesotans. I can think of our musicians, for example. They had shows booked out through the end of the year. March hit, the virus hit, all those shows were canceled. I know one young man who then decided to drive 
Uber. Well, that ended up being a problem, too. People weren't using Uber. And then he went to cook in a restaurant. And then the restaurant closed. Members, we have got to, and so I'm thankful that we have this extension of unemployment benefits. But I will tell you the one thing that I'll be focused on as the incoming tax chair are those tax policies that are going to help our economy recover quicker. And as a former education chair, how we can get those kids in school with their teachers quicker. So this is a good bill and it's something to be glad about, but it's a bridge and we have more work to do. Thank you. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. President. I've been one of the strongest supporters of trying to help our small businesses, our restaurants, uh, and all the businesses in my district since when this pandemic hit through the spring shutdown, uh, through the summer, and now through this second shutdown that we've had this fall. And it's been uh, very difficult for many of the business owners that will talk to me about what they're going through right now. And it's easy, uh, it's easy from the governor to sit in his governor's mansion and just say, well, let's close the businesses, close the restaurants down, and just do takeout and delivery. And if you're down here where he is, you can pull your phone out, you can pull up Uber Eats or DoorDash or, or dial your delivery number of your favorite restaurant and have a meal brought right to you in a few minutes. But out in rural Minnesota, where I'm from, that doesn't exist. And there are many businesses that have had to just close down completely with this shutdown. And this bill that the governor asked for right after shutting down our restaurants and our hospitality industry again is just cookie crumbs from the royal table. This is not a real solution. And the governor has given no indication as to whether or not he's going to continue this Shut down over Christmas, I think of the old Narnia story. It'll be always winter and never Christmas this year, perhaps. I hope I'm wrong, but he's given no indication uh, where he's going to go and his next decision. The announcement was going to be last week, then the announcement was going to be today. Now it's moved till after the legislators are gone and out of here because I think a lot of us would have had a lot to say, uh, depending on what his decision is going to be. But it's time for the governor to realize that businesses are hurting and being told, oh, just do takeout and delivery is a slap in the face. And these payments of a little bit of money here in this bill are a drop in the bucket compared to what the governor's taking from them. We know that coronavirus itself hurt a lot of businesses and a lot of industries, but the governor's executive orders have come along and finished a lot of them off. And more will come if this continues to drag out. So I understand uh, the, the point behind this bill. I know there are many uh, things that are good things that are in this bill. But as been said before, our restaurant owners don't want a handout. They want to be open. They've known how to do this safely. They've been able to do this safely for months. We've seen the numbers. The numbers were already going down before this shutdown was instituted. They've continued going down since then. The numbers are pretty similar all over this region, no matter whether the state has these lockdown orders or not. But if you bring this evidence up, people are telling me all the time they're following things. They have brains and common sense, and they're asking me, why are we making decisions like this, even though the numbers are pointing this way or the situation is changing this way. The governor doesn't listen to that unless it's the numbers that as he wants to interpret them and how he reads them with his team. And that's harming Minnesota, especially rural Minnesota that's being completely shut down by this. So I can't bring myself to vote for this bill today. I know there's a lot of good things in it, a lot of good intentions, but it's time for the governor to recognize that 
he's finishing off a lot of good businesses and hurting a lot of families, especially out in rural Minnesota. And we need to have some real solutions to open up, to help out, to give a good Christmas gift and extend a helping hand to these families. Thank you. Senator Paul Anderson. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, back in June, when we passed the Small Business Emergency Relief Bill, uh, I would have really hoped we wouldn't be here today, but we are. And I do want to first and foremost thank Senator Pratt for all his work uh, on behalf of the Senate Republican Caucus. I want to thank the, the four leaders for coming together and getting this done with the administration. Um, but before the back slapping and the high fives and the press releases are screamed out here in the next couple of minutes or hours, um, we need to take a step back and realize this is taxpayer dollars. These are the same businesses that we're trying to help that have provided the money for the general fund to be able to come to their aid and give this lifeline at a moment they desperately need it. We have to keep this in perspective that this is a second lifeline that they've been asking for, but they don't want, has been stated already here today. A lifeline needed because of shutdowns, pauses, limited access or ability to operate as uh, executive orders have mandated. We need to do everything we can members, and I won't be here in just a couple weeks, but I urge you to do everything you can to work with this governor, best he will allow it, to do everything you can to allow these businesses to reopen, to operate smartly with COVID in mind. These businesses are doing everything they can to survive, and if they have survived to this point, many of our friends and neighbors have not they will not come back. Entrepreneurs are some of the toughest, uh, most driven people that I've ever come to know. My dad was one. We are a small business family. I own a small business now that's been able to survive through this, uh, challenging as it may be. But members, I just ask you, we have to come out of this sooner than later. Their livelihoods, their dreams depend on it. And again, if they've been able to survive until now, give them this lifeline and let them open up and let them do business. Thanks again, Senator Pratt. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. I too support the bill. I'm grateful for what's in the bill. I'm disappointed in some of the things that aren't in the bill, daycare, long-term care, people who desperately need help. A lot of the renters and the homeowners who are paying mortgage who haven't been able to pay the mortgage or pay the rent, who are protected right now, but soon will lose those eviction moratorium protections. They won't have the ability to pay the back rent. We'll be homeless. Very disappointed we couldn't do anything for any of them, but grateful for what we have done in here. It may not be enough to help the businesses. It may not be enough to help child care who's not getting anything out of it. it. May not be enough to help the schools reopen right away. But I'm glad we're doing it. And this is, as I think Senator Anderson said, a lifeline for these businesses. Something that may help them keep their heads above water. And as he mentioned, some of them aren't going to make it. Some of them have already gone under, and they won't be coming back, he said. And that's true, unfortunately. Those 4,500 Minnesotans who have died from this, they're not coming back either. And they matter too. I don't think there's a person in this room who doesn't know some people that they loved and cared about who haven't died from this. I'm thrilled that most of the people who get it survive. They say something like a third of the death notices in the paper these days are from COVID. 
That's on top of everybody else dying. And those matter too. Boy, I want their schools to open for teachers' sake, for kids' sake. I want our restaurants and hospitality industry to open now, as soon as possible. But not if it's going to mean a lot more people dying. Because some of those restaurants, the ones that go under, boy, I've, some places I really love have gone under. I do hope they'll find a way to come back. I don't know if they will. But I can tell you those 4,500 Minnesotans aren't coming back. And so I'm a little bit bothered by some of the rhetoric about the governor not doing anything. If he would let us talk with him, if he would let us do this, maybe we could save those businesses. Well, I'm not sure anybody in this room has a, the wisdom to know how we're going to make sure we can open up everything. The one thing I know we can do is take the precautions we're warned about. If we want to look at this, we've got a president of the United States who's on the way out. But for months, he was saying this was a problem. COVID was just going to go away, magically go away. It wasn't a huge problem. We've heard people even here saying it's no worse than the flu. Well, not that much higher of a percentage die from it, maybe, but 4,500 Minnesotans have died from it. And ridiculing mask wearing. I look around the chamber now, we're doing a lot better than we were a few months ago. But when we had people like the President of the United States, who nobody's mentioned today yet, who was ridiculing people for wearing masks, who was attacking them for it, who was saying you don't need them. I don't know of any public health official in the state or country who is saying right now masks don't help protect against spread of COVID. And if we want to open up these restaurants and the schools and everything else that we care about, if we want to be able to go visit our kids and our grandkids, if we want to have a normal life, we got to get this thing under control. So this bill is a good thing today. Thank you for pushing it. Thank you for bipartisan agreement on this. But let's not pretend that we're doing this because the governor caused this problem, because the governor didn't cause this problem. Plenty of people, I could argue, made it a lot worse than it needed to be. And I do hope we don't lose more restaurants and bars. I do hope we don't lose more small businesses. Wish we could do more for them and for the workers who are unemployed. Wish we could do more every step along the way. But the one thing I do know is if we take the precautions the public health experts say, we have fewer dead people and fewer closed businesses. So I urge us to pass this bill, but let's be careful when we're attacking the governor as if he's the one who caused this. He's been doing a better job than a lot of governors have. He's been working very hard, listening to public health experts, trying to save lives. If we care about lives, which every one of us will say we do, now let's care about them. Let's try and make the actions, because unlike these restaurants, those folks aren't coming back. And I know if we want the businesses to reopen soon, the faster we get this thing under control, the faster we get our health care workers in a safe position. Yes, vaccines are coming, but Dr. Osterholm said the other day again, he said, yes, don't see that as a panacea. The thing we do know works is wearing masks and taking social distancing. So let's do our part about that instead of attacking others who are trying to do it through logical and attempts to be as scientific as possible in what we close, recognizing the harm, economic harm, recognizing the loss of social life and the loss of business economic activities but also recognizing that we as people can do certain things to help control this. And that in the end is gonna be the biggest solution to this, not just the vaccine, but our behavior and that. So please vote for the bill, but recognize that we're gonna have a bad problem and the bill won't do enough to make up for all the harm that is inevitable given the crisis. Final comments by the chief author, Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, thank you uh, Mr. President. Um, I'm pleased, I'm, I'm not pleased. Um, I'm glad we're bringing this bill on a bipartisan basis. And I wanna thank 
our Senate staff, uh, Mr. Eilers, uh, Mr. Beshe, who put in uh, literally uh, hundreds of hours, our nonpartisan staff, uh, Ms. Doyle Fontaine and Mr. Mum, uh, who helped us through this. We wouldn't have got this done without the cooperation of Commissioner Grove and his team. Uh, Senator Champion was on the calls with us all along the way, working through the details. And uh, his LA, Shamika Boygan, was there with, Bogan was with us uh, as well. Uh, we had the House with uh, Representatives Mahoney, Knorr, and Baker uh, all working on this bill. And, and I want to thank the stakeholders because we did have a hearing, Senator Bingham. We did have a hearing, and we had the counties, and we had the hospitality community uh, talking about the need and the benefits of this bill. And we did have a public hearing, and we do have the support of those uh, stakeholders. I'm going to take a cue out here off of off Senator Marty here, and I'm just going to I'm just going to give you my opinion for a second. And I don't mean to break the spirit of bipartisanship here, but I've been listening a lot. Make no mistake that we are here today because the governor shut down bars, restaurants, fitness centers, and other businesses that were identified in Executive Order 2099. We knew the spike was coming. We knew it last spring. We talked about it through the summer. We should have been ready for this without shutting down our local economies again. And we talk a lot about the business owners. These businesses, these businesses, these businesses. Who are these businesses? These businesses are your neighbors. They're the people you go to church with. They're the people that you coach you sports with. They're the people, they're, they're the parents of your kids' friends. They might be people you graduated high school with and knew your entire life. This is not about some faceless business. This is the people that we know in our community, and they're hurting. For owners that took great care and expense to protect their customers and their employees from contracting COVID, they've been harmed in a rash action taken on conjecture, not science. We find ourselves in this predicament because the governor's executive order and the governor's executive order because of his extended emergency powers. We would not be in this special session if it were not for the executive power, emergency powers, and we would not be working on this bill if not for his executive order. To paraphrase the governor, about a month ago when he was in Senator Housley's district, I don't disagree with the governor's emergency powers because he's a Democrat. I disagree with the governor because he's been wrong every damn time. But I hate to allow our business people in our main streets to die because of this action. I would love to tell Governor Walls, as Senator Matthews pointed out, that he has to live with the, to be accountable for his decisions. In fact, on the night that he announced this executive order, he held a press conference and when they asked him about his plan, he said, well, that's up to the legislature. So if we don't take action, what are the costs? Are we willing to decimate our main streets? Are we willing to make this, uh, basically allow thousands of our neighbors to lose their livelihoods, including not just the business owners, but the people they employ? and make this recession work when we could have helped avoid some of it? And when these businesses close their doors and file for bankruptcy, what will the ripple effect be? If you vote against this bill, what will the effect be on your local real estate market? Well, what will the effect be on your county's unemployment? If entities had outbreaks, they should carry the brunt of the impact and potential close until their facilities are cleaned and procedures have been updated. But business owners that have taken the precautions and have effectively stopped the spread of the virus, they should be given a chance to survive. 
I share a lot of the frustration and anger. We need the governor to open up these businesses immediately. I'm frustrated that he promised that he was going to announce his intentions on the executive order on Friday, and it's been pushed out until after this special session. But in many ways, the damage has been done, and I hope we're not too late to, to save and heal some of the damage that's already been inflicted. Members, I encourage your vote for this business and employee relief bill. And let's try to keep, as I told Senator Herr just a little bit earlier, let's try to keep the plywood out of the windows while they're forced to keep their doors locked. So members, I encourage a yes vote. Senator Kent, final comments from the minority leader. Thank you, Mr. President. And I want to thank everyone uh, today for their engagement in these incredibly important conversations that affect um, so many people and our economy and our, um, our well-being physically and economically uh, in every corner of this great state. I want to take a minute to look at this day um, on a few notes. Um, first of all, this is the spe seventh special session uh, since we've uh, adjourned sine die in May, uh, which is historic, and many of us would say not necessarily in a good way, um, but we have worked together and we have tried to do good work on, the pe for, on behalf of the people of Minnesota over these spe seven special sessions, and, and this one is no exception. Not without bumps, not without challenges, but here we are. I will also point out that this is the day that the first American received the first vaccine for COVID-19. And many have said, hopefully, this is the beginning of the end. But we know that this won't happen overnight. It will take a lot of time still to get enough people vaccinated twice in some cases, and then to build up the immunity to work together so that we can be safe again and so that we can uh, go back to the interactions that so many of us believe make life worthwhile. And that includes family gatherings, religious gatherings, celebrations of life and death, and retail therapy, and going out and shopping for times together, for cooking, the things that we do that we enjoy, for the activities that we have outside together, for the activities that we want to have inside together. But I also think it's important to remember where we are in this moment. Some have said numbers are getting better. And in some metrics here in Minnesota, yes, we are seeing some improvements. But I will remind us that as of today, we have had over 382,000 cases of COVID-19 confirmed. And our seven-day average right now is 3,995. That is just under 4,000 cases a day, if you look at the average over the last week. 4,462 4, 4, Minnesotans have lost their lives, and that seven-day average right now is 66 per day. So while the numbers are improving in some respects, not all of them, they are still too high. And the concern is that they could flare right back up, and we'd be back in the same place that we were looking at just a couple of weeks ago. Our healthcare workers, are doing truly heroic work. And in some communities, they are stretched way too thin. The fact that they are looking at some hopeful numbers is good news, but not something we should at all take for granted. And we all have a responsibility to make sure that this does not get worse again. One thing that we know we can all do is to take care of each other as we've discussed, wearing masks, socially distancing, not gathering together outside of our immediate families, which is hard. But as we've also discussed, far too many of us have lost people in our lives who we value or are deathly worried about people right this moment. We need to take this seriously and we need to take care of each other. As we look at this particular bill in front of us, 
which is designed to help Minnesotans in a lot of ways. Um, small business relief is a centerpiece of it, but it's not the only part. A lot has been, there's this ongoing debate. Why is this, why are businesses hurting? Why are they struggling? Why are they facing the challenge? It's this debate. Is it the governor's fault um, with, I think, some really unfair characterizations about the way he has tried to handle this for shutting down these businesses? Or in fact, is it the fact that there is a virus? And even if he had not shut down these businesses out of a sense of caution and trying to stem the tide of the harmful effects of this virus and the effects that it has on our healthcare system and the effects that it has on all of us if we don't take care of it. I would point to Iowa. There was an article not that long ago that looked at Iowa, and this was a little earlier before this um, w fall winter surge really got going. But Iowa really didn't have many restrictions, but they had a lot of business slowdowns and struggles and businesses shutting down because people, even though they could go to those businesses, made the choice not to because they knew that there were risks. And the reality is, until we get this virus under control, and that is going to be a combination of this vaccine, which will take time, we all need to step up and get the vaccine when it is our turn, and we need to do it responsibly, but in the meantime, we still need to practice the measures that will keep each other safe. And the more we can do that, the sooner our businesses will be able to more fully reopen. And as has been said, and I could not agree more, the most important thing is that we need to be able to get our kids back in school. But we can't just wave a magic wand and make that happen. Minnesota schools were having staffing challenges before we even thought about a, a, a pandemic. And this is not helping. So we're looking at this bill today, which is important relief and important steps and I am going to gladly support this bill. Um, but I need to say, as others have, we need Congress to really step up in a meaningful way because we do not have the ability with our budget to come anywhere near meeting the needs that are out there. We could support these businesses through these months until we can really get through the vaccine if Congress would step up. We're gonna provide a little bridge and hopefully that will happen and then it is not necessary for everything to be on the backs of these small business owners. We can share this together. Small businesses do need our help, and I'm glad we're able to do this, and I really am grateful to Senator Champion, Senator Pratt, um, all the staff who has worked so hard, Commissioner Grove, Commissioner Doty, in coming up with some pretty creative solutions so that we can make our state dollars work as hard as possible and support as many businesses as possible. But part of this is looking at where we are right now, and part of this is thinking about where we're going to be as we come out of this. Part of this is making sure that we don't decimate some of our economic infrastructure between now and that time. And that is true of these businesses that we're talking about, restaurants, bars, bowling alleys, the, the, the businesses that make up um, the, 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 the very fabric of the communities that we all represent and all love so much and the people who, who run them and the people who work for them. But that's the point. This is not just about saving a business for the sake of saving that business. It's about that business's um, contributions to the community, the fact that they employ our neighbors, the fact that they are there for um, uh, the Lions Club fundraisers and the many things they do to make our community strong. But part of this is about the workers. And so I am glad that we were able to come to a compromise. And this is truly one of those cases where we came to a compromise and there was a lot of giving on this one. Um, but we need to support our workers. And this is a part about looking forward as well and thinking about this in the big picture. This is not just a handout to people who have been laid off for the, through, through no fault of their own. This is stimulus back into our economy. These are folks who are gonna take every single penny of that support and put it back into these very same businesses in our communities. And so it's a good thing on a lot of levels that we are doing this. But there is more that has, has been said, and I won't belabor it too much, that should be in this bill for these same kinds of reasons 
child care. We should be doing something for child care. Those are small businesses who need our help, and families are having to make difficult decisions about their children's care. And as some child care centers are having to shut down, that means workers don't have a place for their kids to be so that they can go back to work. And if you listen to the Minnesota Hospital Association, the lack of access to childcare is actually a serious problem with our healthcare workforce and people being able to show up and take care of patients in our hospitals and in our care system. We also know that childcare facilities has not been a new problem, particularly in, across greater Minnesota. We listen to businesses across the state for years now talk about the challenges that they have because their workers don't have access to good, convenient childcare. This is not new. This will not help. If we do not support our childcare infrastructure and we lose more childcare facilities, that is not going to help us rebound as we come back and it is not gonna help those businesses that we're supposedly here helping today. Childcare is an important part of this conversation. We also are not providing $500 for working low-income Minnesota families who desperately need it. This is, um, these are federal funds, they are already there, we could do this. And that is another case. I, I forget the numbers, I think that adds up to $16 million of federal funds that are already there for us, that if we would do this, that is $16 million that in an instant would be spent right here at Christmas time. Do you think those families might be able to use that money in their local communities if they had access to it? But we're not able to do that today. And that was a compromise that is an unfortunate compromise that I don't think helps business either. We've talked about long-term care and that we should be doing that. And we've talked about important steps to continue providing the services for people who are experiencing homelessness, isolating folks so that they don't spread the disease. Um, these are things that we've been doing and because there's a, 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 a an end date on that, we could have done this and extended those services and helped sustain this aspect of our communities as well. But we're not doing that and it's unfortunate. As I've said from an economic standpoint, we need to be looking forward. But as a body, we also need to be looking forward. This is a, a turning of a page. We will come back in January as a new legislature, as a new Senate. And I have listened to colleagues on all sides of the aisle today talk about our process. And I hope that people are taking this seriously. Because we have had opportunities to work in a transparent way, to have meaningful discussions about all of these issues. I'm glad that there was a hearing about this bill. But I would submit that we probably could have done something a little more exhaustive and a little more engaging of more members, of more stakeholders, of the public. So that as we're coming back in January and looking ahead, and I know this is going to be a, a process where we have to work together, and we really do need to work together to make sure that we can work together safely, but also do so in a way that is accountable and responsible and transparent to the people of Minnesota. We need to have agendas that mean something that are posted on a timely basis so that people know what to plan for because this isn't going to be where people are just milling around the Capitol waiting to drop into a hearing if they find out their bill's actually being heard. We need to do this better. We need to have agendas that leave room for people to ask questions and get information. We need to be able to have people come in and provide varying viewpoints, not just one person's. So I appreciate all the comments that we've heard on that one, and I want to look forward in a way that is positive and responsible. And let's do, let's commit to all working together and hearing each other out and having a process that we can be proud of and that the people of Minnesota can have faith in and that as we see this time, time period between now and the end of May, when this session will end, this next session will end, that, and hopefully in person, hopefully safely. Um, everything hopefully can look very different than it does right now. But we have that in our control. If we operate safely, if we make good decisions, not even when we're just in this building, but when we're out in our communities, we have the ability to make this better and to have a much better process as we move forward. So I take this bill as a step in the right direction, but it is a small step 
and there is much more needed to support our communities, our businesses, our workers, and for this body to continue doing this incredibly important work as we move forward. Thank you. Senator Benson, final comments? Thank you, um, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Pratt, and everyone who worked on this bill, Senator Kent, for your significant contributions. Um, a couple things I've noted over the past couple of days, there are businesses who are saying they're gonna open regardless of what the governor does. That's not the act of defiant rebels, that's the act of people who've lost hope. So this grant money will give them some hope, but it's not gonna build a bridge to a long-term business strategy. They are going to lose their retirements, their livelihoods, their home, if they're not allowed to open. That's very real for them, and if we don't acknowledge that that is part of the damage that is done by these shutdowns, then we are missing the boat. I suggested that we don't punish those businesses who are doing their best to comply with the standards set by the Department of Health and DEED. That instead of across the board shutdowns, pauses like this, we let businesses operate with a plan in place and if an identified outbreak occurs, they close down, they get retraining for their employees. That accomplishes the goal of rewarding those who are doing their best and limiting the impact, the harm, only to those who haven't been able to keep their customers safe. Reviewing what we have heard about the governor's actions, I know there are members of my caucus who have been pretty harsh, but I think the public deserves some answers. What question is the governor gonna use to determine if he lifts this pause, not just next week, but when is he going to open these businesses for good. It's probably gonna be a long time. But what's that metric? And I asked Senator Kent this in June or July. I've asked the governor, still haven't heard an answer. Now we have a vaccine, huge news. I hope that it is safely rolled out as quickly as possible. Are we gonna wait until we get herd immunity? Are we gonna wait until there is 70% vaccine compliance. Herd immunity is 60 to 70%. I hope to God we don't wait until there is 70% vaccine compliance because there is not enough small business grants to get these businesses through until that day. So as good as this bill is, and as much as this work is really important, Opening our economy is the only way to long-term keep employers employing people and mortgages being paid and all of the things that we so much desire. Funds are limited. Regardless of what the feds send us, funds are limited. We will be in session in January. It will be our job to make good choices to help Minnesota's economy get back on its feet. I am looking forward to leaving here tonight and coming back with all of you in January, refocused on building our economy and doing so as we start coming out of this pandemic. And with that, Mr. President, I would like to thank Senator Pratt and encourage a yes vote. Seeing no further discussion, the Secretary will take the roll. Members in the retiring room, please come in to vote.
Yeah, good thing. President's office, please come in to vote. Capital 206 and 237, come to the floor and vote, please. Room 303, come to the floor and vote, please. If anybody hasn't come to vote, come to vote now. <laughs> Senator Jasinski, are you ready? Yes, I am. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Jasinski. Senator Goggin votes yes. Goggin votes aye. Senator Miller votes yes. Miller votes aye. Senator Ingebrigtsen votes yes. Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Lang votes aye. Senator Howe votes no. Howe votes no. Senator Western votes yes. Western votes aye. Senator Jensen votes no. Jensen votes no. Senator Weber votes yes. Weber votes aye. Senator Newman votes yes. Newman votes aye. Senator Kiffmeyer votes aye. Kiffmeyer votes aye. Senator Dames votes aye. Dames votes aye. Senator Chamberlain votes aye. Chamberlain votes aye. Senator Rood votes aye. Rood votes aye. Senator Anderson B votes no. Anderson B votes no. Senator Gazelka votes yes. Gazelka votes aye. Senator Rosen votes aye. Rosen votes aye. Senator Limmer votes aye. Limmer votes aye. Senator Housley votes aye. Housley votes aye. Senator Abler votes aye. And Abler votes aye. Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Carlson votes aye. Carlson votes aye. Senator Clausen votes aye. Clausen votes aye. Senator Dibble votes aye. Dibble votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Dietzik votes aye. Senator Eaton votes aye. Eaton votes aye. Senator Franzen votes aye. Franzen votes aye. Senator Frentz votes aye. Frentz votes aye. Senator Hayden votes aye. Hayden votes aye. Senator Isaacson votes aye. Isaacson votes aye. Senator Klein votes aye. Klein votes aye. Senator Lane votes aye. Lane votes aye. Senator Latz votes aye. Latz votes aye. Senator Little votes aye. Little votes aye. Senator Newton votes aye. Newton votes aye. Senator Rest votes aye. Rest votes aye. Senator Simonson votes aye. Simonson votes aye. Senator Sparks votes aye. Sparks votes aye. Senator Torres Ray votes aye. Senator Torres Ray votes aye. Senator Wickland votes aye. Senator Wickland votes aye. The secretary will close the roll. There being 62 ayes and four nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. R Remaining on motions and resolutions, under motions and resolutions, Senator Senjo. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, I move that Senate file six which is a, a fix-it bill, if you will, uh, to the November bonding bill be taken from the table. On that motion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's adopted. Senator Senjum. 
Mr. President, I, uh, I would move that an urgency be declared within the meaning of Article 4, Section 19 of the Constitution of Minnesota with respect to Senate File 6, that the rules of the Senate be so far suspended as to give Senate File 6 its second and third reading and place it on final passage. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion's adopted. Senator Senju. Uh, Mr. President uh, and members, Senate File 6 is a, it's a technical fix bill to the November bonding bill. It, is, uh, it comprises of nine specific projects, uh, eight of which uh, uh, are uh, related to the November bonding bill. Uh, one of which, uh, a housing bill, a Senator Dietzik housing bill in, in Minneapolis is related to the 2019 bill. Uh, four of the nine are uh, what we call the PFA. Yes, Senator Public Senjum, one second. Yes. We need to give the bill a second reading. I'm sorry. Not your fault. <laughs> Sen Senate file number six, a bill for an act relating to capital investment. Second reading. Okay, Senator Senjum, go ahead. Okay, continuing on. Uh, uh, this bill, nine projects, uh, four are related to uh, public facility authority fixes that the uh, administration of that agency has suggested need to be done before the uh, funds can be released. Uh, they comprise of Vernon Center, Monoman, Orinoco, uh, Mendota, actually, and, and South Haven, so five of the nine. So those communities, uh, one related to transportation, Highway 14, County Road 104 in Olmsted County. Uh, another uh, transportation uh, in Golden Valley, Highway 55. It happens to be a bridge which spans Highway 55, a pedestrian bridge. Uh, students going to a high school there, uh, I would suggest badly needed. The last one I mentioned already, Senator Dietzik's uh, a housing bill in Minneapolis having to do with an application for housing that uh, for reasons related to COVID and delays and things like that, uh, this, uh, the effect of this bill would be to refund $300,000 back to the, uh, to the nonprofit agency that uh, had applied for the federal non-exempt bonds. They would in turn then be, be able to use that on, on another housing project. So that's the sense of the bill. Senator Pappas and I have been working on it. I don't know if she's on the floor. There she is. Perhaps wants to speak and affirm, I believe, the virtues of this bill and we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, Sen Sen Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Senjum, for being diligent and working on this fix-it bill. Um, I think it's important. We have the opportunity to do this during a special session. We should move ahead and do it. Uh, otherwise, these projects are going to have to wait until the spring or later before they can start their project and get their funds. Um, and they've already waited long enough because you know, we didn't pass the spring bonding bill until late fall. So I think it's important that we move ahead with this bill, and I support it, and I urge the members to also support it. Thank you. Okay. Mr. President. Uh, Senator Stengem. An error for an error. Uh, I need to offer the A1 amendment. No. <laughs> Secretary will re report the amendment. Senator Senjum moves to amend Senate file number six as follows, page two, lines five to seven, delete. This is the A1 amendment. Senator Senjum to the A1 amendment. Uh, and Mr. President, this really alludes to some of the comments I've already made about the bill relative to uh, uh, Mendota, Menomen, pardon me, South Haven and, and the uh, Minneapolis housing project. So uh, it just, uh, again, uh, no more to be offered there. It's been said, uh, that's the amendment. Any discussion on the A1 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Any further discussion on the bill? The Secretary will give the bill its third reading. Senate file, Senate file number six, a bill relating to capital investment. Third reading. Any further discussion? The Secretary will take the roll. The Secretary will take the roll.
Members in the retiring room and the president's office, please come to the floor to vote. Room 206 and 237, please come to the floor to vote. Room 303, come to the floor and vote, please. Senator Kent, you ready? Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Carlson votes aye. Carlson votes aye. Senator Clausen votes aye. Clausen votes aye. Senator Dibble votes aye. Dibble votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Dietzik votes aye. Senator Eaton votes aye. Eaton votes aye. Senator Franzen votes aye. Franzen votes aye. Senator Frentz votes aye. Frentz votes aye. Senator Hayden votes aye. Hayden votes aye. Senator Isaacson votes aye. Isaacson votes aye. Senator Lane votes aye. Lane votes aye. Senator Latz votes aye. Latz votes aye. Senator Little votes aye. Little votes aye. Senator Newton votes aye. Newton votes aye. Senator Rest votes aye. Rest votes aye. Senator Simonson votes aye. Simonson votes aye. Senator Sparks votes aye. Sparks votes aye. Senator Torres Ray votes Aye. Torres Ray votes aye. Senator Wickland votes aye. And Wickland votes aye. Senators, if you haven't come to vote yet, come to vote, please. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Goggin votes aye. Goggin votes aye. 
Senator Miller votes aye. Miller votes aye. Senator Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Lang votes aye. Senator Howe votes aye. Howe votes aye. Senator Westrom votes aye. Westrom votes aye. Senator Jensen votes aye. Jensen votes aye. Senator Weber votes aye. Weber votes aye. Senator Newman votes aye. Newman votes aye. Senator Kiffmeyer votes aye. Kiffmeyer votes aye. Senator Dames votes aye. Dames votes aye. Senator Chamberlain votes aye. Chamberlain votes aye. Senator Rood votes aye. Rood votes aye. Senator Anderson B votes aye. Anderson B votes aye. Senator Rosen votes aye. Rosen votes aye. Senator Housley votes aye. Housley votes aye. Senator Abler votes aye. Abler votes aye. Senator Johnson votes aye. Johnson votes aye. Secretary will close the roll. There being 64 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. Remaining under motions and resolutions, the secretary will read the author's motions. Senator Senja moves that the name of Senator Pappas be added as co-author to Senate file number six. Senator Westrom moves that the names of Senators Thomasoni and Rarick be added as co-author to Senate file number 19. Senator Jasinski moves that the name of Pappas be added as co-author to Senate file 21. The author's motions read by the secretary will be adopted as one motion. Oh, we got a vote on that? All in favor, I don't have that power. <laughs> The author's motion is read by the secretary will be adopted as one motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion, motion is adopted. The secretary will read resolution number five. Senators Kent and Latz introduce Senate resolution number five, a Senate resolution commending Dr. Pam Paulson on retirement after 33 years of service at the Perpich Center of Arts. The resolution will be referred to the Committee on Rules and R Administration. The Secretary will read Senate Resolution Number S 6. Senators Gazelka and Benson introduce Senate Resolution Number 6, a Senate resolution honoring the life of Ronald John Lidner of Brainerd, Minnesota. That resolution will be referred to the Committees on Rules and Administration. The Secretary will read Resolution Number 7. Senators Gazelka and Kent introduce Senate Resolution Number 7, a Senate resolution rating relating to adjournment of the special session. Senator Benson. Mr. President, I move Senate Resolution Number 7 be adopted. Any discussion? Um, Mr. President, this is the adjournment resolution. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The 13th order of business is announcements of Senate interest. Without objection, the following senators will be excused from today's session. Ralph Alday, Eaton from 4.30 to 4.45, Klein from 3 to 5, and from 7 till the end, and Gazelka from 7 till the end. Are there any other announcements? I have one. Since this is my only day, I figured I better thank you all for letting me do this. This is a great honor, and I loved every second of it. So, Senator Benson, would you like to make a motion to adjourn? Mr. President, I move that the Senate do now adjourn. Signee die. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The Senate is adjourned. Signee die.